What is up, Packers fans, and welcome back to another episode of The Daily Draft, brought to you by Badger State Brewing in beautiful Green Bay, Wisconsin, just minutes from Lambeau Field. I am your host, Ross Uglum, the publisher of Packer Report, and we are talking, honestly, a, a, a still, I would say, a significant position of need for the Green Bay Packers, and that is running back, and I would have no other man join me to discuss running backs than my guy, Emery Hunt from Football Game Plan. Emery, how are you doing, buddy? Doing fantastic, man. I appreciate you bringing me on the show. Absolutely. So uh, for kind of uh, just, you know, our, our 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 watchers, our listeners that are really Packers kind of centric, um, can you just kind of explain who you are and what you do? I'm a football analyst. And simply put, you know, so catch me at Football Game Plan. Catch me on CBS Sports HQ. I produce the largest draft guide in in history and currently – um, with the football game plan draft guide, which you can pre-order at footballgameplan.com slash 2024 draft guide, 900 individual scouting reports. And you can find me all over your internet and also all over your streaming devices. I also call games too, uh, college football games. You see me every Saturday at somebody's press box, uh, calling the college football game. So I've seen a lot and done a lot as well. I didn't really, so you take on the beast. That's the, that's the one, right? The, uh, the Dane Brugler one, the beast. That's what you're, they call it. Yeah, so your your guide is bigger than the beast. Way bigger. And again, it's not list. It's if it's my guide this year is 900 pages, which means it's 900 individual scouting prospects. So last That's year awesome, I did over man. a thousand. So yeah, every player has I don't do a top 10 and then list the other guys. Every player in the guide has an individual full page scout report. That's awesome. That's awesome. That that'd be a big one, honestly. If you if you like to get deep in the weeds, then I mean, like, if, if I, I would guess there's going to be most of the undrafted, like the priority free agents, you're going to have a scouting report on, and not not everybody does that. Not, not everybody, everybody does. Yeah, we're we're very pleased to have you know 280, 290 uh, folks in our guide, and, and then have that kind of skewed towards the Packers. So we have like a very specific uh, you know thing that we're trying to accomplish. But that's that's awesome, man. Um, all right, I'm going to roll real quick here uh, into the state of the room for the Green Bay Packers, and, and it's a super interesting one, and it's something that em Emery and I are going to talk about in a second. Um, everyone knows what happened, right? First day of free agency, um, and, and it's funny, the order of operations, too, because before everyone was jumping up and down, because the Packers signed, in my opinion, a top five safety in football, and, and certainly I would say the best player at their biggest position of need. I mean, they went out and got the guy in Xavier McKinney. That happened second. The first thing that happened was sort of a what the hell. And the what the hell was acquiring Josh Jacobs as an unrestricted free agent uh, from the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. Jacobs was the NFL's rushing leader in uh, 2022, um, hit the magic 370 touches mark and did not have the same – season in 2023 that's something that we'll talk about as well uh, but Jacobs is 26 years old um, Green Bay signed him to a big deal that is really more like a two-year deal and then we'll see but a four-year 48 million dollar contract and for just an hour or two uh, people thought that that you know the kind of the quote-unquote thunder and lightning was just going to be Josh Jacobs upgrading the AJ Dillon thunder aspect of it and and you know pairing himself with uh, Aaron Jones, Aaron Jones asked to take a pay cut and chooses not to do so, ending up signing with the NFC North's Minnesota Vikings. And then in a completely odd reverse, of course, backers go with Thunder and Thunder, adding A.J. Dillon back to the group. Uh, Matt uh, LaFleur is saying really interesting stuff. You know, um, Packers fans, or I've been certainly talking about the fullback tight end kind of hybrid position that the uh, Matt's good friend Kyle Shanahan uses out in um, – uh, San Francisco with Kyle Juszczyk and Green Bay ran after that position by using a third round pick on Josiah DeGuara in 2020. That has not worked out, but even the idea that they might look at Dylan at some fullback or some H back is super interesting. And I think also opens you up to, well, they're definitely a, I think they were always going to take, take a back because Green Bay is not the type of club to have two second contract backs and nobody, I mean, they want young, fresh legs. Every, every team does. Um, but if they're going to use Dylan a little bit at fullback and a little bit at H back and a little bit at wing tight end and a little bit there and a little bit, like you might still be looking at, at two running backs that they might want to add. Um, I remember the year that they added Aaron Jones, they took Jamal Williams around four, 
Aaron Jones in round five, and then Devontae Mays in round seven. Now, Devontae didn't make the team, but this has been a team that will take a shotgun approach um, at the running back position. Emery, what was your take on kind of the Aaron Jones of it all? 29 missed, I think, seven games last year, if not a few more than that, but incredibly productive, especially incredibly productive in the last two games of the regular season and the playoffs. Um, but but Josh Jacobs did something Aaron Jones never did, which was lead the league in rushing in 2022. Uh, what was kind of your thoughts on everything that went down there on uh, on free agency day one? Well, it just shows you what the the league thought of the upcoming uh, draft class at the position. You know, they didn't see particularly a quote unquote foundational guy in the backfield. So, you know, they went ahead and, and was very active in free agency. We saw a lot of trades, saw a lot of surprise moves. Uh, cuts and quickly teams jumped on these guys but for the Packers I, I felt like wow you you know what's the plan and like you said for about an hour you're like well are they going to use both guys and then we got that answer pretty quickly and then you bring back A.J. Dillon uh, to the fold but listen you know Jacobs is someone he's a slasher a one cut downhill guy with some quickness I feel like Aaron Jones went out with a bang had a you know masterful performance against San Francisco in the postseason and yeah, I feel like he's a more fluid runner than Josh Jacobs, but I understand them wanting to get younger. You don't want to have someone that you don't kind of know if he's going to be healthy one week or the next. Jacobs gives you at least some continuity in that aspect, but at least you were able to upgrade or get another good back. Some teams leave an option and don't have an answer on the on the roster. We saw the Dallas Cowboys go through that all last season, thinking, hey, we can just get rid of Ezekiel Elliott because Pollard is the guy. Pollard was not the guy. And so now they're back in the in the mix for getting someone uh to tote the rock. And uh, but Green Bay did add a had a plan in place and it worked out perfectly. Yeah. I, again, I, I think you know, emotionally, like Aaron Jones was such a good human being, um, and and was so proud to be a Green Bay Packer, talked about quote unquote carrying the G, um, did wonderful things in the community. Everybody knows the situation with his his dad and um, you know like his brother being, uh, you know, a twin brother kind of being in and out of the league. And, and um, just there were so many different aspects of Aaron Jones that were such a fun narrative and such a fun story. And he was such a good dude. I mean, he was, I had the opportunity to interview him a couple of times when I was out in green Bay. Um, he early in his career, I did a lot of uh, posting like preseason clips. He's a fifth round guy, but, uh, and, and this is not like, Oh, look at me. I'm so smart. But like, I, did a lot of posting his clips in preseason and then when, when he was getting early touches like hey this might be the guy folks this might be the guy and he reached out he's like hey thanks for the love and so i've always had a soft spot for for aaron but father time does no jobs man he, he is undefeated and i'm not sure that this was not maybe getting out one year too early but you look at the games missed and and i'm with you there i think um they had a plan in place they identified Josh Jacobs as somebody that that they wanted to add, and I think Josh Jacobs and Aaron, Aaron Jones could have been super fun. It, it's not really the uh, the path that they have ultimately chose chose to go down, and that that happens. And you could see, I mean, with the the uh, reported like pay cut he was asked to take, and the deal he ended up getting from the Vikings, it wasn't that much different. You know, the, they gauged his market um, pretty well. Okay, uh, diving into the kind of thresholds, Brian Gutekunst, people know, um, people that watch this show know we have a decent grasp, and you can find more about that grasp in the um, Green Bay Draft Guide powered by PAC, a report of some of the requirements. And and they're not, you know, uh, locked, set in stone requirements, but if you can get sort of a grasp on um, what they like to do from an athletic threshold standpoint, it has done a really good job of pointing you kind of towards who they might take. It, it has been very predictive um, of who you kind of can narrow down who to get excited about or who to watch or who you might expect Green Bay to, to call their name. Uh, right now, I will tell folks that we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight or ten guys that fill out everything that Gutekunst wants. And, and I'll, I'll give you kind of those, which is um, they like the relative athletic score, which is a composite score of athleticism. And, and Green Bay probably doesn't use this specifically. In fact, I think we kind of know they don't. But there there is a 
there is a correlation to to the high you know composite testing score whether they use spark whether they use their own formula whatever the the proof is in the pudding especially since ted thompson took over they do prefer bigger backs um they have they've shied away from the the sub 205 pound backs and you can see that with what they have at aj Dillon and josh jacobs right now and they do view short area quickness as important three cone is important to them i think we found the most uh correlated test to who they take and who does well and what is actually broad jump and do you broad jump during a football game no you don't but um it does i it does lead you directly to short area explosiveness that's what the the broad jump um, is I'll give you guys uh, by the draft guide, so we're not going to give them all away, but I'll give you guys the top three ranked tier one guys, meaning that they hit all four of of what uh, the Packers like, and that is uh, Trey Benson, Will Shipley, and Jalen Wright. What are your thoughts on on those three guys? And then, of course, I'll just give you this because everybody's going to know Isaac Garendo hits all all of their requirements because Isaac Garendo hits every requirement because he absolutely lit the combine on fire but what are your thoughts on on some of those guys and any other um maybe just super athletic guys that are bigger that you kind of like maybe more than other folks you know it, it's fascinating because benson would fit what they already have on the roster and what they've done you you look at a guy like emmanuel wilson kind of is like a trey benson uh, and what he brings so i can see them leaning in that direction because that's kind of what they've they've it's almost like you could peg wide receivers at green bay like too um just how you can see the running back position trends that way as well. And so, yes, Benson would probably be the best bet out the three. I like Benson. I do think he's a solid player. You want you, It's good to see him get his burst back that he had at Oregon. Uh, Shipley, Shipley, to me, seems more like a complimentary guy. Uh, I think he's more of a special teams type type back, uh, in, you know, in terms of like he can return kicks, he can – you know, shifty enough to return punts. Uh, you can learn that. Uh, you can get him out there as a, as an RB three. You know, he can help you out in the passing game, but he doesn't really have that that explosive element of like can hit the home run. Benson has a little bit more of that than Shipley does. Uh, and so, and when you think about the back that probably is a, another one that fits their mo, you talk about Garendo. That would be the one that you know he's my number three back in his class because he's so explosive and. His first step explosiveness is is tremendous. He was a former kick returner. That tells you a lot about someone's long speed. Um, and you know when he was at Wisconsin, and then he goes to Louisville and does his thing there in a reserve role, but was able to make an impact when he got the opportunity. Had a really good East West Shrine Bowl a week as well. Um, I would also talk, toss out Isaiah Davis of South Dakota State, six feet, two hundred twenty two pounds, was a finisher, um, forty time. Is not the fastest, but when you watch the games and you see him finish runs and rip off long runs and be able to close out games, and what he did as the as as a backup to Pierre Strong uh, his freshman year in the playoffs, uh, more particularly against Sam Houston in the championship game, Isaiah Davis was outstanding uh, running the football. He's one of my favorite backs to watch in this class. Yeah, he's. Uh, you can see I'm. I'm at the uh, Bison Report studio. He did. Some, he did some awful things to North Dakota State over the last four years, um, and and. We'll we'll give one more away here. Isaiah Davis is one inch on the broad jump from being a tier one fit and checking every box. He is literally an inch from being exactly <laughs> what the Packers look for in a running back. And I I will say um I, I, I actually do want to get into Garendo because he's the guy that I'm not as high on as you. Um, and part of it is I I actually felt like he. He has obviously the, the straight line speed or the, the top end speed. There's just no arguing about that. Um, I did feel sometimes it took him longer to get going. Like there's some buildup to getting to the, the straight line speed. And um, I I just, the other more, I think, obvious concern, and, and that would be the one that I'd want you to, to address is like, why was he always in a reserve role? Why was he the? Th why can I believe, or why should I believe that the third running back at Wisconsin and then the second running back at Louisville is a top three back in the entire class? Right. That that I feel like is a fair question. People always ask that, but they never they never bring up the Memphis examples. We had your Daryl Hendersons and all those backs that was kind of like a, a quarter of the backfield, right? Like there was a run for a three year run where everybody was flocking toward Memphis backs and they all split time. 
Um, it was like five backs in that backfield that was that were good good runners. Uh, Garendo's the same way, and I, I think this dates back to high school. Um, you know, now back when I played, so we're talking like I was class of '99 high school, so that era of, of high school ball and college ball. Um, you know, it was like, hey, you dot the I, you're the lead guy, and you were trained that way. But these guys now, man, like they no one's a lead dog. You rarely do you see a dude that's maybe Braylon Allen, um, who's who's constructed that way. But for the most part, a lot of these guys are, are coming in not built to handle full time roles, and the game has changed to where these guys are now kind of conditioned to be I don't want to say spot guys, but kind of part of a committee. So that's that explains that for me. Um, now he's not an overly shifty guy. Uh, he is he's kind of like Michael Bennett, if you remember him, uh, another former Wisconsin running back that, that you know played with the Vikings, but was explosive straight line speed. Like if he gets a lane, he's kind of like Michael Turner as well too. He gets a lane, and you see the acceleration, you see the explosiveness. But pre line of scrimmage, he doesn't have the shiftiness. He's not he's not a creator. Um, but man. If I can say every game he's going to give me at least a 20 to 40 yard jump, I'll take that 10 times out of 10. Yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from. You mentioned, and I think with us being a Packers show, we have the large Wisconsin crossover. I'd, I'd be remiss to not ask you about Braylon Allen because I, you know, I think he's probably the most high profile badger. Um, people talk complain about the center of the Bordellini kid because he blew up the combine too. Um, and I, I kind of like him, but. I think the, the highest profile badger this year is is probably Braylon. Just get your thoughts because I, I think folks watching this show probably will be interested. He's my number one back. Um, Whoa, okay, all right. Because he he's he's like he's like 12 years old, right? This dude like yeah. came into college like super young. Um, so he still has a long runway to go. And I like the fact that he came in as a young back uh and thrived in that role. And then I feel like because he was so young and we talked about him early and we, we say this is a joke, but it's kind of true for some players. They get the prospect fatigue. Like people just got tired of talking about Braylon Allen um, and moved on to other players, but he's still pretty doggone good. He has good footwork, good patience, um, good contact balance. Now he's not the short area explosive guy, but he doesn't get really, he rarely gets, you know, you'll see him get run down, but it's not like where you say, yo, that guy is slow. He has some speed. He's probably the only foundational back. When I say foundation, I'm talking about, you know, a guy that you can plug in as a starter. Like if I'm Dallas, that would be the guy I go after um, is Braylon Allen to pair up with everything else they got on the roster. Um, but, yeah, I feel like he's he's a good all around back um, just because he didn't catch the ball a lot at Wisconsin doesn't mean he can't catch the ball. So in a class where you're looking for who's the one that you can kind of trust to be a starter. Um, if you need one, it's to me, probably Braylon Allen. I want to talk about real quick, in a very short detour. I want to talk about my guy that I actually feel like can be that. And I, I kind of had similar, similar feelings that you had on, um, Braylon Allen in that I really only saw one guy. Like I, I see what you're talking about with Trey Benson. Like that's my home rent run hitter. I actually agree with you. I think I probably have slightly higher expectations or think there could be more of, a role for Will Shipley, or I'd be more excited about like his third down back slash special teams capability. I'm kind of with you on what you said. And actually, Will, if you just said, Ross, you can, you can take a back and throw him on the Packers at whatever pick kind of makes sense. Fourth round, Will Shipley, Green Bay Packers, RB3, special teams, pass catcher with, with uh, Josh Jacobs, with um, uh, AJ Dillon, and then your, your RB3, your, your gadget back is Will Shipley. Like I'm in. If that was, if you just said Ross, you can make one decision. That would be what I would do. But the one guy that I kind of view as who you're talking about is is uh, Jonathan Brooks from Texas. Now we get none of the athletic testing data because of the late injury, and we also don't know like is he going to miss some camp? Is he going to be ready for preseason? Is he going to be ready for the season? Season? Those kind of questions. But I felt like I saw kind of everything in in another you know, uh, small sample size because, well, yeah, we had Bijan and we had Roshan and Jonathan Brooks had this short runway because he was the guy and then he got hurt. What are your thoughts on Brooks? Because I kind of profiled him as my only the guy from this whole class. What's funny about Brooks, I interviewed him at the combine and okay. 
just um you know he was on set with us and, and just it's like clearly i'm a football guy and um so my my journalistic questions went out the window i i didn't even ask him about his knee injury because he was walking super normal i just forgot he got he tore his acl like he wasn't walking with gingerly or walking with a limp so it didn't it didn't come across my mind that oh yeah this is a dude that had tore his acl like mid-season i was like so i forgot to ask him about it. that's how good he was walking around so based off my untrained uh medical eye he might be ready for camp right uh with the way these acl treatments and trainings are, are, are coming uh have come along but uh you know he's he's a, he's someone i felt like he was a little uh clumsy in a in a sense like always getting tipped over always trip you know tripping like his balance was kind of thrown off um, I still feel like he could gain some more weight and not lose speed and not lose acceleration uh, that could help out with his balance um, instead of him, you know, getting like tipped over, tipped over a lot when he when you hit, a, hit his legs or whatnot. Uh, but, yeah, you saw a difference in how Texas was able to run the ball when he wasn't there. And Baxter is a good back. Uh, but Brooks was the one that they leaned on when they needed a big play. And I'm big on backs that have uh, and players in general. But when you have a great sense of timing, like, man, we need a big play, and you be the guy that make the play, that's the kind of guys you kind of want on the team. You see it a lot with defensive ends, like knowing when to get pressure and when to get that sack. Backs are the same way, and Brooks has that. One last guy that I want to get your quick opinion on, and then we'll get into kind of my favorite guys in the class as it pertains to, like, consensus. Like, you know, my, not, not here's my top five, although I kind of do want your top five. Um, but people can get mine whenever they want it. Uh, Audric Esdeme, um, he is a guy that did not run well at Notre Dame. He's a guy that I'm not as high on. I'm interested to see where, where you're at, but there's, there is a, um, and now I think he just makes very little sense. Cause I, I think you can do thunder, thunder and thunder. Like there has to be some diversification of, of weapons. What are, what are your thoughts on the back from Notre Dame? I don't want to, you know, poison the water by letting you know, like I, he's not one of my guys. But there, are, there is a subsection of Packers fans that are like, "Oh no, this is the dude." Well, listen, it's a great question because if you were to ask me to recreate the Packers backfield of Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon, I'm taking Marshawn Lloyd as the Aaron Jones because he reminds me so much of Aaron Jones. I love Marshawn Lloyd so much, and I'm I taking him humble, but I love him. And I'm taking RJ Estimate as the AJ Dillon because that's sure, who I'm yeah. to. That's exactly who he is. Now Dylan was a lot faster um at 250, but Estimate is not as explosive in, uh, as as Dylan, but they're the same type of runner, if that makes sense. And so that's where I see him, which is why I feel like you don't need a yeah. uh, you know, an estimate on Green Bay. You have that already in a more explosive package in Dylan. Um, but he's a little tight hip runner. Not elusive, you know what I'm saying? And, and so he's more straight line-ish. But, man, there's a bunch of Audric estimates in this class. And that's where you kind of – like when when guys see my grades in terms of the running back position, there's like a, a long cluster of guys with the same grade because yeah. yep. that's where this class to me is. I've got a big chunk of guys right in between like overall player 104 – and like overall player 140. I mean, like a, like a, like a chunk. Mm -hmm. um, but no, estimate that was my thing. I I just kept saying it was like, you want a less explosive AJ Dillon because that's what I see here. And and for and by the way, Packers fans are he does not have a hundred percent approval rating if, <laughs> among Packer fans. So uh, anyway, I'm glad we're kind of on the same page there. Okay, uh, if yeah, if you want to give your top five, I think that would actually be. Pretty cool just because, you know, most of the guys that we've talked to have been, hey, who do you like more than other folks? But I think the running back position is so undecided that even just hearing your top five, I think, might be valuable. And then if you want to touch on a few other guys where you do feel like you're higher than consensus. Braylon Allen is my number one. Uh, Marshawn Lloyd is my number two. Uh, Garendo, we talked about, he's my number three. At number four is Isaiah Davis out of uh, South Dakota State. And I'm um, oh, sorry, number three, I have uh, Davis. Four, I have Garendo. Five, right out of the top five is Frank Gore Jr. I think people are sleeping on how good this dude is just as a football player with the ball in his hands. Um, but he definitely won't be a Packer because he's 5'7 
and one ninety nine. Although we can get him a, you know, we can get him a, we can get him a couple sandwiches, get him up to two hundred five yeah. to help meet that threshold. But uh, I like him a lot. And one guy that uh, I'm a big fan of, just just studying his game. And you know, when you get as I, because I agree how I grade, I grade by position. So I watch one quarterback, then I'll watch all of them, and then move on to the next position. So I don't mix and match prospects while grading, right? So as I'm deep into the running backs, Marcus Knight of Tennessee Tech, fantastic running back, uh, six feet, 227, tremendous athlete. You cover uh, FCS football, so I know you probably recognize the name. And he was a guy that played at Montana. He, he was a starting tailback at Montana. Then he started to play lacrosse at Montana. Then he transferred to Tennessee Tech and was part of a committee. But every time he got the ball, he was like, this dude's bringing some juice with him. And at 227, I'm like, okay, I can rock with that. Uh, so that's somebody that I really like coming from the FCS ranks. And, a, and a, of course, Jaden Shirt. have been called 11 of his games in the last three years. You talk about someone that's on the – you have you're on the edge of your seat every time he touches the football. That's Shirt. Because best believe you're leaving that game, he's having a 70-yard touchdown run. Um, and that's someone that does it. If, and what was great for him this year was what Keaton Mitchell did last year. Because now it got people to focus on, you know what? We can get backs that may be under 200 pounds that have that level of explosiveness to be a part of the puzzle and have success. So I think Jaden Sheridan has a bright future. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, my guys um, that I, I think I'm still even after and not the combine went terrible for him because it didn't. Um, I'm still willing to give Blake Corum a shot understanding that it is very much uh maybe a one contract situation uh just so many miles uh, at michigan i mean they they depended on him in a huge way but i even saw some of the, the ways that he received the ball and and plays he made in the passing game in the college football playoff and i just especially when you know we're talking about um as a compliment to the guys the packers have now i think blake Corum could really be something um i like and, and again, this is maybe a little bit skewed because of what, what Green Bay's needs are. Will Shipley, Dylan Lau, New Hampshire, Dylan Lau can do a bunch of things for you. And and that's a guy that I'm I'm probably higher on than most. He, he's my eighth running back, Dylan is. And I, I would guess that that is probably higher than, than some. And then I think everybody's interested in, you know, from a strictly athleticism standpoint, Jalen Wright is just about Garendo. Not not quite, but but just about. I mean, Jalen Wright tore up the NFL combine, multiple explosive plays in the SEC. Um, and and he's a, a guy that's interesting because kind of the Garendo thing where it was not that much production, not that many touches, not that many carries, not that much tread on the tires. Now it's a chicken or the egg thing. Well, why wasn't he better? Why didn't Tennessee use him more? Why, you know, why wasn't he more productive? All those things. But I think Jalen Wright is a, a really, really interesting guy for the Packers and, and somebody that I um, am probably higher on than most. And, and other than that, one guy, the, the the last kid that I do want to touch on just, just briefly is Tyrone Tracy. What what are your thoughts? I, I, want, I do want to get your take. Tyrone Tracy from Purdue. I think he's a former wide receiver, um, put on a little bit of weight, I like him in the passing game. Obviously, you have that wide receiver background. Um, ran well, good athlete. I mean, really, really good athlete. And I wonder if there isn't a little bit of of juice kind of in a player like Tyrone Tracy where, you know, late-ish career position switch, maybe not that much on tape. Um, interested to just see your thoughts on him before we wrap things up here. Yeah, I was the sideline analyst for the Hula Bowl this year. So, you know, I was down there all week. Um, watching these guys practice and going through it. And then, you know, you're watching Tracy. And I, I'm glad I got to talk to him during the game. I'm like, listen, man, normally you see guys that are uh, that were former receivers kind of play running back like receiver, i.e. Antonio Gibson, which is why I wasn't as big of a fan. I felt like even though he was six feet, 230, he played like a receiver playing running back. You know, he wasn't he didn't he didn't see it properly. I uh, was trying to get to the outside right away. Didn't take on contact. But Tracy plays like a dude that played running back his entire career. If you told me he was a receiver, I'd be like, nah, ain't no way. You know what I'm saying? It, but he was a receiver for, what, five years uh, and then made the switch going to Purdue. I'm sorry, going, uh, yeah, uh, you know, making the switch at Purdue. But down at the Hula Bowl, I mean, he's running through contact. 
He's running with great pad level, lowering his shoulder to finish a run to get into the end zone. And he's he's yoked up, you know what I'm saying? So he's a legit, he's 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 probably Ty Montgomery, if we think about it. That's exactly who he could potentially be. Maybe a little bit more natural of a runner um as a running back uh than Ty Montgomery was, but same type of MO, a guy that can help you out on both ends offense. Love that. Wrapping up the show with a Ty Montgomery comp. I'm going to take this last question. That is the question that we have been asking at the end of each of these shows. Will the Packers, with one of their seven picks in the first five rounds, and those come from the Rasul Douglas trade, the Aaron Rodgers trade, and the compensatory pick uh, that the Packers get from the Jets signing Alan Lazard? Yes, I do believe Green Bay will take a running back at some point. Um, I would start looking at those two, those picks at 88 and 91 in the third round. I would start looking there. And then, you know, whether it's those one in round four, one in round five, um, I wouldn't honestly be that shocked if it was maybe one in round three and one in round five. Although the AJ Dillon re-signing does sort of, uh, I mean, maybe put a damper on that. Maybe more like one in round three, one in round seven, something, something like that, just because, um, you know, how you're not going to keep four backs. You're probably keeping Dylan. How high do you want to draft a guy that might end up on the practice squad exposed to other teams? I don't, you know, I don't know. Emery, man, thank you so much. This was, this was awesome. I think we touched on a number of guys. I think you, you know, you did, we did our job, which was to kind of educate and point people in the direction of, of guys that might be Packers and just guys that might be good football players at the next level. I appreciate you, man. Anytime. Appreciate you bringing me on the show. All right, folks, hope you enjoyed watching. Hope you enjoyed listening. If you are on the podcast side, how can you help us out? Buy the Green Bay Draft Guide, powered by Packer Report. Use the promo code DAILY, that is D-A-I-L-Y, for 10% off of that very draft guide. The link should be right here in the show description. Follow me. I am at Ross Uglum. Follow us at Packer Report. Um, give us a shot on the VIP side. It's just a dollar for the first month. And if you love it, you can easily transition to a much lower price on the annual side. Have a great rest of your day, folks, and go pack go.